Hi, I'm Sean Mooney, professor at the University of Washington and Chief Research Information Officer of UW Medicine. Over the past two years, we have been creating an initiative in medical data science, and as part of that, we have created this seminar. Speakers will include world-leading scientists who will tell us about how data can impact human health and their health care. Please use the link below to register for our mailing list to hear about future events in this series. We hope you enjoy them. And with that, then I want to present, uh, introduce Ashley Keeman. She's, she's a uh, chemical and biomolecular engineering PhD and a, and a fellow in the, the Wirtz lab, the lab of Dennis Wirtz. She's going to be pre presenting today on the use of AI to map large volumes of tissue and tumors in single cell resolution. And with that, Ashley, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Noah. Yeah, so thank you all, uh, and apologies again that Denny is unable to make it today. We just had a little mix up with scheduling, but I'm so excited to be able to show you the data on my own anyways. Uh, my name is Ashley Keeman. I'm a postdoc fellow in Denny's lab who developed the technology that I'll be talking about today. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll take it away. I'll be talking about a technique called CODA that I developed in my PhD studies in Denny's lab and applications of that that technique to human pancreas. Uh, so in all of my talks at the beginning, I like to go back to the foundations of human anatomy because I think it gives a good analogy to the way that we study tissue mapping today. Uh, so the beginnings of anatomy can um, be followed all the way back to ancient Egypt when knowledge of the human body was needed uh, to be able to dissect people and in the acts of mummification. Uh, but between about maybe 2000 BC and about the 1550s, uh, little was done uh, in the study of human anatomy because it was thought of as taboo to, to cut open human bodies. Uh, a lot of this changed with a Belgian scientist named Vesalius, and specifically the publication of this book that I'm showing on the slide. And what I love about this book is that it was highly successful, um, mainly because of its aesthetics. Um, up until this time, a few books on anatomy had been published um, to little success, but this specific book is believed to have led to the founding of thousands of schools of medical anatomy um, and to um, kind of the demystification of human dissection. So what I like about this is it's believed today that the success of this book and of Vesalius' science um, was both a combination of his novel scientific findings and the aesthetics of his book. And I like to think that today in the study of tissue anatomy and single cell mapping, that uh, both novel findings and the way we communicate them um, help lead us to success. So uh, with that, that's kind of the lens by which I, I like to show my data in my talks. So specifically, um, I'll be focusing on a disease called PDAC. Uh, PDAC is uh, one of the deadliest malignancies in humans um, because of a couple of things. So one, PDAC develops slowly and asymptomatically in humans. So it's often not caught until it's distantly metastasized. Uh, at the same time, PDAC is believed to metastasize quite easily because it hijacks uh, the existing ductal system in the human pancreas, as well as the blood vessels and the lymphatic vessels. So again, because of this, uh, most patients at the time of diagnosis have distant metastases and as such have few clinical options. So this in mind, um, when I joined Denny's lab as a PhD student back in 2017, um, my goal was to develop a technique to study the development of PDAC and the tissue in which it's developing. So to do this, we wanted to begin by looking at healthy pancreas tissue, as well as uh, the neoplastic cells as they develop into um, the non-invasive neoplasm called PANIN, and then eventually invade and become PDAC. So I'll be talking a lot about PANIN today. This is the, the second image to the left in the little histological images on the slide. Uh, PANIN is um, 
a known neoplasm that develops in the ductal system of the pancreas and is believed to develop into PDAC. Uh, most of us, as we age, will develop cannons, but each one of those has a quite low chance of eventually invading into PDAC. And which ones do invade and maybe symptoms of this uh, have not yet been found. So that's one such question we sought to investigate. Um, second, uh, as we studied Pannon and PDAC, uh, specifically in histological slides, we wanted to go a step beyond past studies that have mainly looked at these diseases in two dimensions. So if you look at the image on the left, this is an example of a histological image that allows us to see um, single cells and tissue bodies uh, within the human body. But we wanted to go beyond this uh, specifically because PDAC is a ductal disease. So it's developing in these hollow tubes inside the body. And if we look in this 2D image, um, I'm pointing to some, some ducts on this slide. One thing obviously that we can't know is do these ducts connect? Uh, do they not connect? What's the spatial association of them to say blood vessels, to fats, to anything else going on in the tissue? So we wanted to um, develop a technique that could study big volumes of tissue uh, at single, single cell scale, and that was highly quantifiable. Uh, but to begin with, I want to talk a little bit about a, a competing technique and why we thought this was not a good fit. So uh, most labs, scientific labs who uh, study tissue mapping, I would say use confocal and light sheet imaging. And I have an example of this uh, playing in the video on this slide. I, I hope the videos play well on Zoom because I have a lot of them today. Um, but light sheet imaging is a way to uh, visualize intact human tissues. And it has a few uh, positives and negatives. So as in this video, uh, which is labeling PDAC using CK19 and is labeling the uh, adhesion molecule ECAD, um, a benefit of this technique is that uh, many methodologies exist. So if you have a tissue you wanna visualize, you can likely look up a means by which to do it. And it's well suited when you have specific scientific questions. So again, in this video, uh, we wanted to look into um, which locations of a PDAC have ECAD positive, ECAD negative cells. So this is a good means by which to do that. Uh, a few negatives, you have to choose the labels in advance. So like in this tissue, uh, we can label the epithelial cells with CK19 and we can label the ECAD, but anything we don't label, we can't see. So maybe something exciting is happening in this tissue and we just don't know it because we didn't label it. So it's invisible. Um, second, you kind of have to balance the volume of the tissue that you analyze and how many labels you have. So uh, in this video, it's a, a decently big volume, so we only have two labels. If we zoomed in a bit and um, wanted to image a, a small piece of tissue, we could maybe go up to five labels, uh, just being able to get that many uh, antibodies into the tissue. And finally, and I think most significantly, is uh, this confocal and light sheet imaging data is kind of famously difficult to, to quantify. So you'll see a lot of labs uh, publish studies using these techniques, but few of those will include complex quantification because oftentimes even segmenting the tissue bodies in the images can be a challenge. So with that, uh, my goal was to develop a new technique that we can use to model volumes of tissue that kind of balanced out some of these negatives. So I like to show this video um, close to the beginning. This is an example of uh, tissue containing pannin that we modeled using CODA, which is the technique that I developed in my PhD. And uh, with this technique, we model um, tissues on the scale of about a, a dice, a gaming dice. Um, with labeling of up to 11 tissue bodies and at the scale of uh, say the size of tissue, so the size of dice, all the way down to single cell level. And we, use, we model this using image analysis and AI techniques and um, the, the whole data set is highly quantifiable. So uh, the bulk of my talk is gonna be split into two components. Um, I'll spend a bit at the beginning talking about the methodology behind CODA how we can use histological slides and AI to build these uh, models of volumes of tissue. And then second, I'll talk about a few applications of this technique to study of pandemic.
So zooming way, way out, um, I made this slide to show in my PhD defense a few months ago and I kept it because the animation was complicated and I think it's kind of cool. Uh, but I also think it communicates uh, what a histological image is quite well. So uh, the way we collect tissues, um, say someone has a whipple done, so a piece of the pancreas is taken out, we'll take a small piece of that tissue and then cut it into many, many thin sections. So the analogy I used when I was explaining this to my mom is if you know how deli meat is cut, like you, you have a knife and you have a block and you cut a thin slice off and the piece falls and then you cut again and the piece falls and so on and so on. Uh, each of these individual slices is taken off and made on a glass slide. Uh, that glass slide is stained with a combination of histological stains, in this case h &E. And this tissue is then digitized and we can identify tissue components in the image. So um, H&E is the most common histological stain. It's used clinically in, I'd say, millions of labs. And uh, using uh, novel image analysis techniques, we can um, begin to quantify things that pathologists have been medically using uh, the past decade to diagnose patients. So H&E is a pH-based stain. So the H, which is the xenotoxylin, is a blue dye, and it's staining mainly the acidic components of the tissue. So the DNA and the nucleus of the cell is highly acidic, uh, so it's stained the blue. Uh, eosin is a pink stain, and it stains mainly uh, basic components like collagen and the cytoplasm of cells and smooth muscle. So these components will stain pink in these images. And finally, um, things like cytoplasm might come out like a, a slight violet because they stain with a combination of hemotoxin and eosin because they have many molecules inside them that um, connect to both the acidic and the basic dyes. So that was kind of the, the basis of an H&E stain. If we zoom out a bit, um, something we can do when we look at one of these images is detect tissue bodies with the human eye. So um, this big object in this image is uh, a bisection of the pancreas duct. And um, a pathologist could identify this. Most of us could identify it with a little bit of teaching. Um, in addition, maybe you notice that the top half and the bottom half of this duct don't look the same. Uh, the bottom half has this nice smooth blue line of epithelial cells, while the top half looks kind of swollen and, and loosen-y. Um, that's because the bottom half of this duct is healthy cuboidal epithelial cells, while the top half is neoplastic cells. So that's those pan illusions that we've been studying. So that in mind, um, knowing that we can detect a lot of tissue bodies in h &E images by eye, and we can scan them and then begin to identify them um, in an image, uh, we had an idea that we could take many, many of these sections um, and apply a few image analysis techniques to be able to quantify the tissues in these um, volumes. So again, step one is taking a tissue block, sectioning it into many 2D planes, and then digitizing all of those. Uh, the next step is physically aligning those uh, independent 2D images back into what we call a, a digital tissue volume. Uh, next, I call tissue multi-labeling. That's actually segmenting uh, distinct tissue bodies in the images. And then finally, detecting cells so that we could combine the cell detection and the tissue multi-labeling to identify the, um, the cell type of any uh, cell in the tissue. And then finally, when all of this is combined, we can um, segment specific tissue bodies, visualize them, and quantify them. So I'll just quickly step down um, each component of this technique and then get into some uh, analysis at the end. So uh, step one, and I, I condensed this down, I think, to two slides, but I'd say it made up at least half of my PhD, so it was not simple by any means, is taking these independent 2D images and aligning them back into a tissue volume. So uh, I explained this just simply in a video. Uh, again, I hope this video is playing well for you all in Washington. But what you should be seeing is on the left-hand side of this slide, um, kind of a, a thin piece of tissue that's kind of moving and jiggling. So uh, I made this video by taking a thousand H&E sections and just moving down each image one at a time. So beginning at the top of the block and slowly going down to the last image in, in the sample. 
So on the left is what happens if I just take the images as we scanned them and compile them into a, an image sequence. Well, next to that, I'm showing you the same, in, the same tissue image sequence, but following the application of the code to digitally align the samples. So if you look in the little zoom in window at the bottom, um, you can see that following the application of the code, we have this nice, nice smooth continuum. Uh, and you can see a, a duct as it moves within the tissue block. So once this is done, um, we have nice smooth connectivity, but we still don't have any, any labels yet. We just have like a, a nice little visualization of what tissue looks like when it's digitized. So the next step was um, actually identifying tissue bodies. So when I joined the lab, uh, Denny's lab classically was actually a wet lab studying cell motility. And he was just getting into the uh, image analysis and AI when I joined. So um, I was coming up with techniques of how to identify these tissue components. And at the beginning, what I would do was just manually outline these pan and these neoplastic cells in all of the images. So that's what this video is showing you is me going down a thousand images and manually outlining all of the cells that I wanted to model. And when I do this, I could then build a little video and show what the pan and connectivity looks like. And we all thought this was so cool. Uh, but what was not so cool is um, how tedious it was, how subjective it was to have me be annotating all of these, and how it was not feasible to scale up. Because as, as soon as I showed this to my boss, he said, This is so cool. Now get me the blood vessel and get me the collagen and get me the healthy tissue. And that was something I was absolutely not um, capable of manually annotating myself in thousands of images. So, this led us to the next step, which was how do we take these manual annotations and build uh, an automated system to automatically label these things that we know the human eye can detect. So I like to show this slide just to give you a quick analogy. If any anyone on the call doesn't know what a CNN is, um, a CNN is a technique by which we can um, use examples of labels and images to be able to uh, set up a system to guess the labels of new unlabeled images. So in, in this example, I show an image of a dog and uh, the output of two types of CNN. So a pixel classification model would be able to tell us that this image contains a dog. It won't give us the location of the dog, but it will tell us, yes, this has a dog in it. Uh, while a semantic segmentation model is uh, not quite as simple to build, uh, the type of uh, input data you give it is, is not quite as easy to collect. But the benefit of it is that it will give you a spatial output. So in, in the output of a semantic segmentation model, um, you can see all of what's highlighted in pink is labeled as dog, and anything highlighted in blue is labeled as not dog. So the value of a technique like this is that we can take the same semantic segmentation model um, that could be used to detect things like dogs and goats and humans and things like that, and instead teach it to detect tissue bodies. So that's exactly what I did with my model. Um, I spent about six months building a pipeline by which we could feed in manual annotations of specific types of tissue like blood vessels, collagen, fat cells, and so on and uh, build a semantic segmentation technique to label these uh, tissue bodies in each of the images. So uh, this slide is just talking a bit about the validation of that technique, which uh, was always twofold. So one step of this was just the qualitative validation. Um, we wouldn't quantitatively check how the model was doing until we could look at an image and think it was doing a good job. So in, in this example, um, so if you look at the zoom in section, I'm labeling uh, what's called asini uh, in light blue is islets. So islets make insulin and glucagon. Uh, you can see a, a small blood vessel and then the components of the duct. So we have the collagen, the healthy epithelial cells, and some tannin tissue. So this looks like it's doing a good job. Uh, the second type of validation that we always do is a quantitative validation which wasn't as meaningful for pathologists that we meet with to check the quality of the data, but it was useful to someone like me who's a data scientist. So uh, what this table is showing is in an ind independent testing set, so an independent image that was not used to build the model, once we apply the model to those images, we can check how it's doing using the testing set annotations. And 
just as a little example, if I look at uh, this box that was just highlighted, this is saying that in 10,088 examples of what we told the model was an epithelial cell, it was also labeling it an epithelial cell, so that's good. Uh, in 50 examples of what we told the model was epithelial, it told us this was acidine. And in 19 examples of when we told the model something was fat, it told us it was epithelium. So this table just gives us a, a quick way to assess how well the model is doing. And in this case, it seems like it's doing a good job. So uh, scaling back a bit, uh, we talked a little bit about the individual components of the technique, but now if we combine this um, image labeling with the image alignment, we can now build um, little visualizations of the tissue. And in addition to looking at the pannin, like we did a few slides ago in my manually annotated example, we can now also see the healthy epithelium, what's next to it, the eyelids, the blood vessels, collagen, fat, and asinine. So we now have kind of a full idea of what's going on in this tissue. Uh, and then the final step of the method that I talk about, but just quickly because it's uh, not quite as exciting. I think many, many labs use techniques like this. Uh, we use a combination of demixing the H and E stain in the images into hematoxylin and biasin components. And then um, just image analysis, identifying the intensity minima in the hematoxylin channel to identify the, the nuclei of cells. Uh, so this allows us to get a cell count in the tissues. And then again, um, I played this video a little while ago, but the combination of all of this allows us to build tissue maps of uh, the human pancreas with labels of things like blood vessels, uh, healthy ducts and ducts containing tannin. And then if we zoom in a bit, we can see components such as collagen, um, blood vessels again, islets, uh, fat, and the acini, which make the digestive enzymes. And then we can zoom in again to show that combining the single cell detection with tissue classification, we can estimate um, how many cells we have. And it flashed up quickly at the end of the video, but just, just in case you missed it, um, in this tissue, in this tissue that's about the size of a, a dice, um, we detected uh, 0.92 billion cells, so almost a billion cells. So in the, the second half of my talk, um, I obviously can't show you all the cool things that we found in these samples, uh, but I just wanna step down a couple of uh, what I think to be the most significant findings and potentially the coolest, uh, beginning with uh, one of the pannin samples. So again, pannin is one of these uh, mucinous neoplasms that develop in the ducts of the pancreas, and these can spontaneously invade out of the ducts and become feedback. So a big question in pannin development is how do these lesions develop in the body? Again, most of us will have pannin at some point as we age, um, beginning at about middle age. So by about 50, um, it's believed that most of us will have pannin. Uh, but a question in pannin development is how spontaneous is this? So do, do all pannin that we see in a, a tissue slide, do they all develop out of a single mutated cell? as opposed to do we spontaneously connect, collect many uh, independent mutations that lead to independent development of pannin. So one way that we believe we could study this is by assessing the connectivity of these pannin lesions. So if I look at a 2D slide, uh, what I can do is outline all the pannin in this image. So that's what the black is showing you, is all the pannin that I identified. Uh, Next, by using the context that CODA gives us, so we now know the, the connectivity of these lesions, I can highlight the connected pannin. So now all of what's highlighted in pink connects someplace in the block. And this little piece highlighted in yellow down at the bottom is a second spatially independent lesion. Uh, showing you this a second way, we can move all the way down the block. Um, beginning at the top and going down about a thousand sections and outline all the distinct pannin. And in this sample, I think I identified 52 independent lesions. So we can show those in the 2D slides as I just did, and then show them as well in the volume. So in just a second, yeah, the, the blue is showing you the, the healthy ducts and then anything that's not blue 
is a spatially distinct pan illusion that's developing in the ductal system. And zooming in on one of these just to show the, the level of connectivity that we can identify. And I think I cut it out of the slide, but this pan contained almost exactly 1 million cells. So these do get quite big. So um, while, while studying the statistics of pan development, at, up to this point, I've studied about 20 of these samples. And one thing that we did was just simply quantify how many distinct panin can we have in one of these samples. Uh, so I quantified total count of panin that I identify, as well as how many fully contained lesions. Because you can imagine if we have a panin that's extending off of the, the sample that I'm analyzing, we don't actually know if it's connected to anything else. So when I looked at the connected, uh, fully contained lesions only, uh, we had anything between two and 65 of these panin in each tissue sample. Um, and I could come up with two possible explanations of this. One of those being that these panin uh, develop simultaneously. So at about, at some point in life, uh, just the likelihood of getting these mutations that, to develop panin goes up enough that we spontaneously begin um, developing multiple panin. And the second explanation is that potentially um, one panin develops and then maybe these cells can actually move in the body. So you can have these distinct panin that maybe have the same mutations, but don't physically connect. Um, this isn't something that can be shown using only h &E imaging, uh, but I actually have a, a second study ongoing with the Wood Lab at Tim Hopkins Pathology that we combine CODA with DNA sequencing to actually look into the, the specific mutations in these distinct panin. Um, but I, I don't have that data to show today. Um, the, the second finding I wanted to talk about with the canon samples is moving beyond just incidence and looking at the, the shape of canon as they develop in, in the human body is something else that uh, is a cool um, application of CODA. So as I began looking at many of these samples, um, I was beginning to notice that I couldn't just take in all of this data uh, by looking at many samples at once. So I, I did something that's commonly done in local imaging, which is to take this data and flatten it along one of its dimensions, in this case, the Z dimensions, so that I could look at the connectivity of these objects, again, in 2D. So in this image, you can see the connectivity of the ductal system in blue, and then the location of all the dimensions. And once I began looking at many of these samples now at once, um, I began to see uh, these two phenotypes. So uh, many of the samples would contain panin that looked tube-like to me. So the, the panin looks a lot like the existing ductal system, uh, while many of the samples looked kind of clumpy. So the location that the panin developed didn't seem all that connected to the ductal system. It didn't seem hollow. It didn't seem tube-like. Um, so I wanted to investigate what was making these two canon look so distinct. But one thing I want to quickly point out is that it wasn't the case that each distinct patient sample would have uh, a full phenotype. Um, in fact, we have tube-like panin in this clumpy example and clump-like panin in the tube example. I just like to show these images because I think they exemplify the, the phenotypes well, but actually most patient samples seem to contain both. Um, so the next thing I did to investigate what was causing this um, is, I again, I think one of the, the benefits of CODA, which is that anytime we identify something uh, questionable like this, we can always go back to histology to see what's going on. And what we found when we did this was that the tube-like pattern that I was seeing um, developed within the ductal system. So they look tube-like because the ductal system is a hollow tube of epithelial cells. Well, the clump-like panin I was seeing uh, extended out of the ductal system into the lobules of AS9. So these lobules, let me see if I can pause the video. Um, the lobules look like little clumps of densely packed cells. This is the location in the pancreas that uh, makes digestive enzymes. And these enzymes will flow up the ductal system and then out into the small intestines. Um, and what we found was that when the panin extend into the lobules, they begin to look like them. So uh, this shows us that the location of the panin within the ductal system in the lobules was dict dictating uh, its shape, 
which is something that just couldn't be seen easily in two dimensions. So the next thing I did, uh, because if you look at this pattern in the video, you can see uh, the bottom half of it looks lobe-like, but the top half looks kind of tube-like. So what I wanted to do was to map in each of these distinct lesions um, how much of each pattern was each phenotype. And I showed this example because I think it uh, exemplifies this well. So in yellow, I'm highlighting the tube-like pattern. So you can see almost a candy cane shape in yellow uh, when the pannins develop in the ductal system. And then in the top half of this candy cane, uh, I see almost an explosion out of the ducts. Uh, and you see these little clumpy blue components kind of uh, holding onto the outside of the duct. And this is often what I was seeing is that most pannin would contain a blend of both phenotypes and that we would often see these clean tube-like locations of pannin with kind of a chaotic lobe-like pannin holding onto the outside of the tube. And when I applied this analysis to many, many lesions, um, some quite small and some quite big, uh, I began to notice some uh, statistical findings. So when I plotted the volume of the lesion against the amount of it that was each phenotype, so the y-axis of this plot is the amount of pannin, that's the ductal phenotype. So if it's high up, it was fully ductal, and if it was low down on the plot, it's fully low blood. And what I was finding was that at low volumes, these pannin could be kind of any combination of phenotype. So they could be mainly in the ducts, and they could be mainly in the lobes. But as the volume went up, they tended to flatten to about 50-50. So about half of the mass of the pannin was in the ductal system, and about half the mass was in the lobules. And what this is telling me statistically is that as pannin develop, they seem to equally invade into both locations. So it, it's not, not as if they tend to like ducts, but go into the lobes when they have to. It seems to be that they'll invade into both locations equally, um, which is significant because in mouse models of pannin, which is how we um, at the moment study how to stop pannin and how to stop them developing into PDAC, um, in mouse models, it seems to be that the pannin heavily uh, invade into the lobules and maybe less so near the ducts. So this is one location um, in which human development of pannin does not seem to match the mouse model that we used to study it. Um, the second big finding I want to talk about moving beyond just these benign lesions pannin is to look into metastatic disease. So PDAC and how it invades into the, the tissue. So specifically in a, a model, um, in a sample that we analyzed that contained both healthy ductal, uh, healthy ducts in blue and some PDAC in yellow, I specifically wanted to look at a location, um, the location that the PDAC is extending out the fastest, if that makes sense. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean. So we collected a sample that contained uh, both PDAC and healthy adjacent tissue. And what we spe specifically wanted to identify and investigate was uh, in which locations is the, is the PDAC most quickly invading and what's going on in those locations. And we specifically identified these two little tentacles that I have highlighted in this image. And then we wanted to see what's going on in those locations. So if I play this video, uh, we can again see the connectivity of the ductal system and then this lobe of PDAC uh, that's kind of sitting on top of one of those big ducts. And if we look specifically at the two locations of invasion, uh, we can zoom in on one of those in just a second and see that in this location, um, the PDAC seems to be following uh, a duct. So the blue is healthy ductal cells. And in the second location, just a second, uh, this is a location of venous invasion. So now you can see PDAC moving inside of a blood vessel. But specifically, we wanted to focus on uh, the PDAC moving along the, the duct because venous invasion is a well known phenomenon. Um, it's well known that PDAC will invade into the blood vessel and metastasize distally. But specifically, we wanted to focus on. Um, this location in which the PDAC seemed to be climbing along the outside of the duct. And we wanted to see, uh, one, is it invading into the duct? And two, if not, what is causing this invasion? Um, 
So my whole PhD, I had monthly meetings with Johns Hopkins Pathology to get feedback on the biological side of this technique development. And what they told me when they looked at this image was that, uh, maybe I can annotate, if we look in the middle, this is the healthy duct. So those little blue cells, that's healthy ductal epithelium. Um, kind of sandwiched in the middle is all collagen. And then all of this messy stuff on the outside is PDAC. So one known phenomenon in PDAC invasion is that they'll invade into the duct and then kind of kill the healthy epithelial cells and substitute them and then climb along the inside of the duct. So when I showed pathologists this image, they told me that if I moved about 10 to 20 images down my Z stack, the PDAC would be inside of the duct. But instead I was moving thousands of images down and the PDAC was not moving inside. It was staying on the outside and just hugging the outside of the duct, which got me to think that maybe it's not the epithelial cells themselves, it's the collagen we should be focusing on. So I looked a bit into what's uh, known about PDAC and collagen and found that high collagen alignment um, is connected to negative outcomes in PDAC. Uh, I also found that it's belief that PDEC can move easily along aligned collagen. But finally, I found that in a, a study utilizing two-dimensional HA samples, um, collagen alignment adjacent to these ducts was believed to be low. So it, it does not seem, based on past studies, that high collagen alignment be guiding this uh, mechanism of invasion. But then I began thinking about um, how past biases could have been affecting this quantification. So the fact that if we look at this histological example of the duct, and then we look at the actual connectivity of the ductal system, if we look at one histological slide, we have no idea the angle that duct was sectioned at. And if we think about collagen alignment, if we do have consistent collagen alignment at these ducts, it's gonna be heavily biased by the angle that we section the duct at. So to give you an example of that, we can imagine a duct that was axially sectioned and a duct that was longitudinally sectioned. And if the collagen is moving, say, along the duct, you will only see that alignment in the longitudinally sectioned example. So that's exactly what we did was um, go back to uh, some of these tissue samples that we've modeled and identified locations of axially sectioned and longitudinally sectioned ducts and then quantified the collagen alignment in these locations. And kind of as we expected, we found that both the alignment of the collagen and the elongation of the nuclei was both heavily guided by the angle of sectioning and was consistently the highest in the longitudinal ducts. Um, so this is telling us that we do technically have uh, collagen alignment next to these ducts. And that's um, not just in this study, but in many, many studies that look at uh, histological slides and collagen alignment, because this is a, a technique that's been applied to many, many um, histological examples. Uh, quantification of collagen alignment shouldn't be done in two dimensions without caution, because in an example like this, you can see how something as simple as the angle of the sectioning blade is affecting uh, the quantification of collagen alignment. So in situations when you have ducts, when you have blood vessels, the collagen alignment next to those bodies is going to be guided by the angle they can section them. But finally, what we found was that uh, in this ductal system, so we have this big U-shaped duct, we find that the collagen is aligned with the duct, so also in the U-shape. Uh, finally, I want to talk about um, one last extension of CODA. So up until this point, I've been showing you what we can do using um, tissue that's sectioned and stained with h and &E. and then we can identify tissue components and cells in the h and &E images and quantitatively model those. Uh, one thing that I didn't show is that up until now, uh, we collect one h and &E section and then we've been skipping two. Um, so we have H and E, skip, skip, H and E, skip, skip, and so on. Uh, something that we've begun doing is in those in-between sections that we've been skipping, we can go back and use things like IHC, IMC, uh, sequencing to add in additional labels. So specifically adding in um, tissue bodies that we can't identify in an H and E image. 
So in this quick example I'll show at the end of my talk, um, we used IHC to label immune cells and immune cell subtypes in the sample. And uh, this slide is just to show that we can successfully align those HME and IHC images. And by combining the um, tissue bodies that we can identify using AI in the HME section, so islands, duct, smooth muscle, fat, asana, collagen, and tannin, with the um, immune cell labels that we can identify in the IHC labeled sections, we can build something as simple as a heat map. So this heat map is showing us uh, which tissue bodies in the sample have the most inflammation in them. And kind of as expected, the PANIN um, has a high association with immune cells, but slightly unexpected is that uh, it's actually the collagen in this case that is the most inflamed, not the PANIN cells themselves. So to quickly investigate this, um, I can show you a zoom in of an h &E section containing PANIN. And in yellow, I've outlined the biggest of these PANIN lesions. Uh, next, what we did was we quantified as a function of distance to the PANIN, moving both out and moving in, uh, how many immune cells do we have? So um, I'm showing you just visually what it means to look into the PANIN. So we began at that yellow line and then moved into the middle of the duct without quantifying the lumen, so not counting the empty space in the middle. And then we saw that the immune cell density in this case was quickly falling to nothing. While if we go beginning at the yellow line and move out of the pattern, we see that the peak inflammation lies just outside the edge of this pattern. And I can fade away to the IHC section and you can see the immune cells labeled and see in fact that we do tend to have most of the immune cells lying just outside of the edge of this pattern. So this is kind of explaining why one slide ago, um, we found that the highest association between immune cells was in fact with collagen and not tannin. But I think this gives us a good lesson in when not to make assumptions. So obviously the collagen itself is most likely not causing the inflammation, it's the tannin, but without investigating this um, spatially the way we did, uh, you may not know that it's actually the pannin um, is causing the most of the, the inflammation in this case. Uh, the second quick example I want to show has um, slight clinical applications. So the, the, main, the main application of CODA, we believe, is in a biological study, not in a clinical application. As you can imagine, just how expensive it would be to collect a thousand tissue slides uh, to be used in the clinic. Uh, but what I want to show is how we think about um, immune cell density and how this can be a bit misleading in, in two dimensions. So, what I did in a sample containing a thousand uh, histological samples, histolo histological slides, um, is I subsampled these. So, I took 10 total slides about equally spaced down the block. And as a function of the distance to the same pan and lesion, I quantified um, the immune cell density. So beginning at the pan and moving away slowly. And what I found was that in some images, we had a high inflammation of the pan in, and as we moved away, it went down. In some images, we see kind of a low inflammation that's kind of staying flat, and then the mean value is someplace in the middle. So this is showing us that um, the, the inflammation in any tissue sample is going to be highly biased by the, the specific tissue section that we look at. Um, so this is why clinically oftentimes patients will be diagnosed using a combination of a, a few histological slides instead of just one, because uh, this is showing us sampling bias. So the second way that we can think about quantifying immune cell density is by now using the whole volume. So now instead of a single tissue slide, I can look at this whole pannin and its connectivity and then quantify as a function of the distance to that lesion what my inflammation is. So now we have this nice smooth line, again, the, the teal is leukocytes, that we have high inflammation of the pannin going down to a bulk value. So this is good because it's now telling us that the pannin is highly inflamed, unlike the 2D example when we had a few slides that didn't have a lot of inflammation. But the downside of this is that we now have lost all of that spatial data. So now we don't know that which locations have high inflammation, which locations have low inflammation. We just know the pannin is inflamed. Uh, 
so the final way that we look at this is using something that we've developed and I call um, tissue immunomaps. So we can plot the connectivity of this lesion and then kind of paint on top of it its local immune cell density. So now you can see uh, the light teal shows an immune cell hotspot. So we have all these locations close to the middle of this panin, kind of on the long tube section that have a high inflammation. And then anything in black is showing you low inflammation. And then I have a couple of histological examples showing how hot these hotspots can be. Um, so in this case, almost 5,000 immune cells within small distance and how cool they can be. So on, on the bottom showing some locations that have almost no immune cells. Uh, so with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions. And again, thank you all so much. It's been um, lovely, lovely to speak to you all today. And I'd like to thank um, Noah and Sean, as well as uh, my lab and Denny who couldn't make it today. Hey, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Kimmon. Very interesting stuff. Yeah, we do have a couple questions, but if there's any more questions, people just make sure you put them in the chat. Um, we can go through those. I'll just start with a couple questions now. Uh, so the question is, could you provide uh, details about the multiplex immunohistochemistry? How long is incubation time with each antibody? Is there overlapping or fluorescent signals? Um, is this talking about the, the IHC beta that I showed at the end? I think this is more at the beginning. Ah, so that might be a slight confusion. So I showed a little bit of light sheet beta. Maybe the question is about this slide. Um, but this actually isn't a technique that we use. All of the labeling done um, using CODA is done using AI applied to H and images. So just simple hematoxylin and eosin staining. Larry, Chir, are you there if you wanted to follow up on that question? We'll, we'll move on to the next one for now. Um, so once you train the convolutional neural network to recognize cells not specific to the organ on which you trained the convolutional neural network, such as fat, muscle, and the pancreas, will it recognize these cells in other organs? So we actually tested that exact uh, question because um, we've also applied CODA to um, mouse samples, um, we've applied it to human skin, uh, we've applied it to lung samples, and what we found is that uh, if it's within the same species, so applying this model to, to mouse samples didn't seem to do well, so we just built new models using annotations on, on mouse tissue in that case, uh, but say when I applied my PANIN model to samples of human skin, it tended to do okay with tissue bodies like collagen and blood vessels, but then anything that it didn't know, uh, like follicles and spike glands, it was just making a wild guess. So it would call some of them asini, it would call some of them panin, it would just look cloudy and messy. So in all of these cases, um, we just built a new model specific to the, the new tissue. Cool. Uh, so one more, uh, remarkable achievements. There's a distinction between identifying cellular types and their positional relationships and making a quote, medical diagnosis. Are you working with MD pathologists regarding how close the system might be toward making trustworthy and accurate diagnoses for different conditions? Pathologists are experts at identifying cell types and relations. However, even they may disagree regarding making a diagnosis. Yeah, so I, I have, um, we meet with pathologists at Johns Hopkins about once a month to get feedback on the technique development. Um, most of this isn't being used clinically at the moment. So we mainly focus on identifying like, is this panin? Is this a healthy duct? Is this PDAC? So not, not things as detailed as would be kind of debatable clinically. Uh, I have a small ongoing study with oncologists at Hopkins that we've been seeing if we can tie uh, histological data to CT imaging. And in that study, I have had a few situations that I'm looking at a slide that maybe um, uh, a pathologist quickly looked at clinically just to diagnose what disease does this patient have. But when I look at them in fine detail, I'm finding something that maybe they didn't look at and I have to ask. 
would you call this PDAC? Would you call this healthy? And we will often see things that might be kind of on the line to a pathologist. But if you think clinically, a patient still has PDAC, even if they have some tissue that's debatable. As long as they have some tissue that's definitely diseased, the patient's diseased. So nothing that's, you know, changed uh, you know, clinical diagnostics by any means. Great. Uh, one more. If I understand correctly, the samples are all obtained from Whipple surgeries where they co-localize with presumably other overt cancers. What do you see with age mesh pancreatic tissue controls without overt tumors? Yeah, so most of these samples, um, the patient did have uh, a disease, obviously, to, to cause the Whipple. Um, some of them had PDAC, some of them had diseases in the islets, in the ampulla. Um, we haven't had any completely non-diseased tissues up to this point, just because it's so difficult to get. We've looked into collecting autopsy samples, um, but I've been told that the pancreas digests itself quickly once a patient dies because it's full of digestive enzymes, and that kind of makes sense. Um, we just uh, built a connection with a, a, a lab that studies type 1 diabetes who does get uh, donated non-diseased samples, so that's something we hope to look into soon. Great. Uh, any other questions? I'll just give a 10 minute pause here if anyone wants to either raise their hand or put anything in the chat. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. K oh, yeah. I have one question. Please. Actually, uh, you know, I missed part of the talk because of a conflict with another Zoom meeting. Uh, but, you know, PDAC is such a challenging cancer. I know you are using that as a model to test the model in a very challenging cancer and try and extrapolate this in other areas. Can this be done the, with biopsy? Like, I, I believe that was being uh, alluded to, or, you know, you had a surgical sample, which you might not have the luxury. Many of these cancers are non resectable. Uh, can this model be built with a biopsy sample? Will that be good enough? Um, do you mean is a biopsy sample big enough? Yeah. So I guess it depends on the type of biopsy. We've looked into using uh, needle biopsies. And I, I think even that, I mean, the model would physically look small when we quantify it, but the technique could technically, technically be applied to anything. We've um, classified tissues taken in even TMA sized blocks. And it, it applies well, it's just that the, the volume of the tissue we analyze won't be quite as big. I may be way off here, but I think, I mean, in the first place, your system is so beautiful, I feel like crying. Congratulations, it's really, it's just magnificent. But um, your system, you were able to see things that could not be seen with other, uh, histopathology techniques, you were able to take dimensions and flatten them. And that is how you were able to arrive at some hypotheses about what's different and why they're different. But you would never do this as a uh, biopsy because it would take too long and it would cost too much. And Physicians and patients don't have that much time, but as a research investigation, it, it's just unparalleled. Yeah, I, I don't think something like this may even be needed uh, in a, a biopsy to, to diagnose, because um, if, if one tissue section is potentially enough to see if the patient's diseased, uh, you maybe don't need a thousand slides. But it is useful, say, if you take what's left of the biopsy sample just to study the disease. I think I heard another, was there someone else wanted to ask? Deshaun, was that? Oh, no, I just want to thank okay. you actually for, that's just a great work and very challenging uh, area. Uh, and this certainly opens so many other opportunities. 
as William mentioned, it's just a beautiful uh, work and model. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Kimmy. That was great. Uh, we really appreciate you coming in uh, and you know helping take over for 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 Dr. Wirtz at the last minute here. I know you were going to present with him, but this, we really appreciate that. And this is some great some great work. I hear a lot of excitement. Um, so here we'll give our, our Zoom clap. We really appreciate it. I don't know, Sean, if there's anything you wanted to say at the end. I have nothing to add. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Yes, that was great. Thank you so much. We'll see you all in two weeks. Thank you. Great.